Hello and welcome to the video on liberalism and World War I. Um, we're going to start with the election of 1912, which had four different candidates. You had William Howard Taft, who was a Republican. You had Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, who was formerly Republican, but by 1912 he has formed a new political party known as the Progressive Party or the Bull Moose Party. You had Woodrow Wilson, who was a Democrat. And then you had Eugene V. Debs, who was a socialist. All four of these people had very different reasons for running. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the name of his platform was New Nationalism, and he wanted to regulate businesses. He wanted a minimum wage. He wanted a pension for old age people. He wanted a nationwide primary, and he wanted women's suffrage. Wilson, his program was called New Freedom. He wanted to lower tariffs. He wanted to limit power in Washington. He wanted to return competition to small and medium-sized businesses. And he wanted stronger antitrust laws and better banking. William Howard Taft, the best way I can describe him is business as usual. By 1912, he was pro-business. He was high on tariffs. He wanted to increase the power of the courts, and he wanted to put limits both on child labor laws and workers' compensation. Then you have Eugene V. Debs. Uh, he wanted public ownership of utilities, public ownership of railroads, and he also wanted a shorter working day and a minimum wage. Debs was also a fan of worker protections and insurance to help injured workers. The results of the election, Woodrow Wilson wins, but that's because the, the Republican Party was very, very split. Woodrow Wilson gets about 42% of the popular vote. He gets 435 electoral college votes. Roosevelt comes in second with 27% and 88 votes. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was in second place in most of the states. Taft, one of the worst defeats ever for a sitting president. In fact, I think it might be the worst period. He only got eight electoral college votes. That's it. And then Eugene V. Debs. No, he didn't get any electoral college votes, but he did get a million popular votes. And that's over 6% of the population. A little bit about Woodrow Wilson. He's the son of a Southern Presbyterian minister. Uh, he grew up in South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, he went on to be a political science professor at Princeton. Then he became a the president of Princeton and a governor of New Jersey. He was very skilled, very flexible. He was very intolerant. He was self-righteous and he was racist as well. Now, as far as his first term goes as president, uh, he's going to convince Congress to sign the Federal Trade Commission Act, and that creates the FTC. And the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, is an agency that can investigate unfair methods of business. It can issue cease and desist orders, and it can help prosecute antitrust um, legal briefs or, or legal situations. He also gets the Clayton Antitrust Act, and uh, that goes with the Sherman Antitrust Act from a couple weeks ago. And what the Clayton Antitrust Act does is it defines and lists specific activities that were illegal that businesses could not do. He also passes the Workmen's Compensation Act, and that gave accident coverage and injury coverage to federal workers. There's the Federal Farm Loan Act that gave low interest loans to workers. And then you have the Federal Warehouse Act that's going to give workers a place to sell and store their crops. In 1916, he wins a second term against Charles Hughes and it's a 49% to 46% victory. It's a lot closer. And then there's the Adamson Act of 1916. Believe it or not, Carrollton, Georgia was, was important in 1916. William C. Adamson, he's a U.S. congressman from Carrollton. He 
managed to convince Congress to pass the Adamson Act, which created an eight-hour workday for railroad employees. And that is the beginning of what is today seen as the eight-hour workday. So good job, uh, William Adamson from Carrollton. Now moving on, the other part of this lecture is World War I. And because it's not a world history class, I'm gonna look at this from the US point of view, but you do briefly need to know a little bit about what, what's going on in the world. There are some long-term causes uh, that are going to bring about World War I. There's expansionism. Many of the empires in Europe are wanting to expand. There's the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. There's the German Empire, the French Empire, Italy, the United Kingdom, Russia. They're all wanting to expand, and there's only so much land available in Europe. There's also nationalism, which is this intense pride in your nation or this tense, intense pride in your culture. And it's gotten really aggressive in the early 1900s. There's a place in the southeastern part of Europe called the Balkans. It's where Roma Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Hungary, Montenegro, that part of the world. And there's this explosion of, of nationalism there where all these pieces of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire want their freedom and they want to become their own countries. And then there's alliances. Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Germany have become best friends in the 80s, in the 1880s. Then you've got Russia, France, and Britain. They have become best friends in the early 1900s. And then you have the Ottoman Empire who's just kind of there. And then you got Bulgaria and Serbia who are right in the middle of things. For your immediate causes, it has to do with an assassination. Uh, Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand, he was the next to be the Emperor of Austria-Hungary. He goes to Sarajevo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, which if you look at the map, the city of Sarajevo is right there where I'm circling the mouse. And the people of Bosnia thought that they were brothers, if you will, to Serbia. And Serbia and Bosnia wanted to join together to become one country. Problem is, as you can see, Bosnia was part of Austria-Hungary. Well, there was a terrorist organization called the Black Hand that wanted to force change. And when Franz Ferdinand came to Sarajevo, uh, he was killed by the Black Hand. Austria is going to issue a warning to Serbia to let Austrian investigators examine all the evidence and conduct interviews surrounding the murder. Serbia had to agree to it or Austria would declare war. Well, Serbia, their big brother was Russia and Russia promised to back up and defend Serbia. Austria, on the other hand, went to Germany and Germany promised Austria-Hungary unconditional support. And this becomes known as the blank check. <clears throat> Basically, whatever Austria-Hungary does, Germany has their back. And then last but not least, there's Germany's von Schlieffen plan. And this was a plan <clears throat> that had been around since the late, late 1800s that basically said in case of war, Germany should strike first and strike fast because it's the only way it would survive. So Serbia agrees to all but one of Austria's terms. Austria declares war. Russia starts to get ready for war. And before Russia can attack Austria-Hungary, Germany declares war on Russia and France at the same time and launches a massive invasion of France based on the von Schlieffen plan. The goal is to knock France out as soon as possible and then turn the entire army around and then meet Russia when Russia gets to the border. Now Woodrow Wilson is going to proclaim the United States neutral. He asks the people to remain neutral in both thought and action. Most Americans believe the country should stay out of the war, but, but very few are neutral in thought. There are about 11 million Americans who did support Germany and Austria 
but most Americans were anti-German because they thought the leader of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II, was arrogant. Now, the U.S. stays out of the war militarily, but they jump in economically. Um, European countries are going to abandon the gold standard, and they're going to buy a ton of gold from the United States. And this actually causes a recession, and the stock market is closed from August 1914 until November of 1914. British and French begin ordering war material from the United States in 1915. The United States does two and a half billion dollars worth of trade and banks lend over three billion dollars to both Britain and France. Now Germany is technically allowed to trade with the United States too, but there's a British blockade and this British blockade stops Germany from being able to trade with the United States. And this led to Germany doing uh, submarine warfare. And the submarine warfare is a big change. Uh, Germany does say, hey, we'll try not to sink U.S. ships, but, you know, sometimes mistakes happen. And Wilson says, okay, Germany, you're going to have to pay for any mistakes that you make. <clears throat> well, in May of 1915, a ship called the Lusitania is sunk. There are over 1,200 passengers on the ship, including, I think it's 130 Americans. But the ship was secretly carrying ammunition. It was perfectly okay for Germany to target it, but the American public had no idea that there was ammunition on the ship. And when it turns out that the Lusitania is sank, uh, it doesn't go over so well with America. As a result, Germany agrees to stop using their submarine warfare, but they start using it again in January and February of 1917. And when Germany begins using unrestricted submarine warfare again in February 1917, uh, the United States, they break off diplomatic relations with Germany. The next thing that happens is Britain intercepts a telegram from a German foreign affairs official named Arthur Zimmerman, and it was meant for the German ambassador in Mexico. Basically, the Zimmerman telegram, uh, it said that if if Mexico declared war on the United States that Germany would help Mexico in that war. Mexico actually considered the offer but decided that they could not defeat the United States and so it never happened. Well, once Britain figured out what this telegram said, they passed the intercepted information to the US government and Woodrow Wilson's going to ask Congress to declare war on Germany. And it does that April 2nd of 1917. Now the problem is the United States is not ready for war. There are only 120,000 men in the entire U.S. Army. The last war the U.S. had been in was in 1898. There's no combat experience. There's no equipment. All the officers are old. And to create an army out of nothing, uh, the U.S. government starts the Selective Service Act of 1917. This Selective Service Act is going to draft over 3 million men. And if you look on the left, that's what a draft registration card looked like. That is actually the draft registration card of my personal great-grandfather. The United States is going to mobilize the economy. There are numerous agencies created to control the war. One of them is the War Industries Board, and that's going to be responsible for establishing production priorities. Uh, basically, the War Industries Board is going to tell the, the businesses what to make and how to make them. Then you have the Food Administration. This is completely optional, but you, know, you were expected to join it, and it was specifically targeted towards women. And the Food Administration, it was led by Herbert Hoover, which was a Republican. And it was responsible for overseeing the production of food. And it was responsible for convincing civilians to conserve food and conserve fibers. The government's also going to run all of the railroads during wartime. So we've got the army being built, we have the economy going towards war, but now we have to sell the people. And honestly, it's not that hard to sell the, the public after the sinking of the Lusitania. But there are still some holdouts, so President Wilson creates 
the Committee on Public Information and then appoints a gentleman named George Creel to be the leader of it. Now, the Committee on Public Information, their job was to create pro-war posters, movies, public speakers, advertisements, you name it. And he is so effective that he produces this anti-German hysteria. Uh, German Americans are victims of verbal assaults, physical assaults, German businesses are damaged, you name it. Another way to get the government to, to uh, get the public on their side was by selling war bonds. The Secretary of the Treasury, William McAdoo, he advertises war bond sales. Basically, people buy savings bonds, and the money from those savings bonds is what's used to pay for the war. The war bonds are so successful that the United States government pays for over two-thirds of the entire cost of World War I with these war bonds or savings bonds. Now, not all Americans are for the war, uh, specifically German Americans and Irish Americans. So the government passes the Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1917, where it becomes illegal to criticize the war, the government, the Constitution, or the armed forces. Now, technically, that is still law today. It's just not enforced. And Eugene V. Debs is going to run for president again, and he runs for president from jail because he speaks out against the government and is arrested per the Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1917. Now here are some examples of propaganda posters. You've got the very famous, I want you for the U.S. Army. Uh, you've got a Food Administration Hunger Breathed Madness. U.S. Army, this is a pretty, pretty powerful one for the day. Destroy this mad brute. That is supposed to be a German soldier coming ashore in America ready to knock out Lady Liberty liberty and ruin our culture. Now what about the actual fighting? Uh, there are about two million soldiers who actually serve in France between 1917 and 1918. And the Americans, they get to France very slowly, they're poorly trained, they don't really make much of an impact. Um, and it's not until the Second Battle of the Marne where the Americans help to stop the German attack on Paris and then they join the counter-offensive. And this is July 15th through July 18th of 1918. Uh, it's really the second battle of the Marne that is the beginning of the end of the war. And all totally, there's about 85,000 U.S. soldiers involved in this battle. And they really help to uh, you know, stop the attack on Paris and turn the German army around. By November 1918, Germany is asking for a ceasefire, and that is given, and the war is going to end on November 11th, 1918, today known as Veterans Day, originally known as Remembrance Day. Total U.S. casualties, about 330,000 killed or wounded. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but when you compare it to France or Britain that had millions, it's, it's not nearly as much. Now, what changes did World War I have to the United States? Well, the war was a boom for the economy, both in industry and agriculture. Factory production rises, prices soar, income rises, food is sent to Europe, uh, and job seekers are going to flood cities looking for work. Uh, African Americans migrate north in large numbers as U.S. factories have to rely on them more and more to fill jobs. And... Over 500,000 African Americans moved north during the war, and as many as 1.5 million have moved by 1920. Now, this is going to cause some problems. There's competition and resentment with northern whites. There's also competition when soldiers return from Europe. And it gets so bad that race riots are going to break out in places like Chicago, New York, East St. Louis, Detroit. And the worst of those riots is actually in Chicago in 1919. Women are going to serve in non-combat roles in the military. There's about 11,000 women who serve. And there are over 1 million women who join the workforce and go to the factories. Now, when the war ends, women are removed from the military. Women are mostly removed from factory jobs, and those positions are returned back to soldiers coming home from Europe. Now, for the United States, this is a bittersweet victory. 
Uh, Woodrow Wilson, he's pushing this idea called the 14 points plan. It's a big lofty goal. There's self-determination. There's freedom of the seas. There's smaller militaries for all. And then there's a League of Nations. The League of Nations is a place where countries of the world are supposed to be able to come together and work out their differences. And it's under the idea of the 14 points that German revolutionaries overthrow the Kaiser and ask for a ceasefire. And there's going to be a peace conference held at the Palace of Versailles. Now, the Versailles Peace Conference, um, the European allies, they ignore Woodrow Wilson and they ignore his 14 points. Germany is going to be blamed for everything. Germany is going to be forced to pay for everything and they're going to be punished. I mean, the country is completely disarmed. All their colonies are taken away and they're forced to pay for the entire cost of the war. The United States is so unhappy with the Treaty of Versailles that they don't sign it. A separate peace is signed between Germany and the United States. And Congress is going to completely reject the idea of the League of Nations. Uh, the League of Nations does go into existence, but the United States doesn't join it. And the United States is the one that proposed it. Now, if that's not all bad enough, in the middle of this whole situation, Woodrow Wilson is going to have a massive stroke and he's incapacitated and his wife is actually going to run the country. Now, also going on at this time is the Russian Revolution. That starts in November of 1917. And a lot of people don't know this, but Russia is actually invaded by a multinational army of British, French, Japanese, and American forces. Now, this invasion is going to fail spectacularly. And what ends up happening, the communists win in Russia. There is this fear of revolution in the United States. The Communist Party, they agitate uh, post-war strikes. And the Attorney General for the United States, a guy named Mitchell Palmer, is going to lead raids on houses of uh, suspected radicals and suspected communists. More than 4,000 people are arrested and almost every Russian-born citizen is removed from the country. And this is what's known as the Red Scare. So, a lot of stuff happens in the 19-teens. And there's even more stuff than what I can go over, but, you know, I know you only have so much attention, so I'm probably at the end of that now. All right, if you have any questions, concerns, anything like that, please send me an email. And don't forget to get your work done for this week and have that completed by midnight on Monday. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.